from um, Genesis 17, verses 1 through 8. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty, and walk before me, and be blameless, that I may make my covenant between me and you, and may multiply you greatly. Then Abraham fell into his face, and God said to him, Behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be called Abraham. For I have made you a father of of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and will make you into nations that I shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between you and me and your offspring and throughout your, their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and your offspring after you. And I will give you and your offspring after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. May God bless this word and God's Dan's message. To send out the PowerPoint earlier this week. I know some people aren't here today just because they already saw the sermon. They got to fill in the blank answers and like, well, why, why do we need to be there right without the... Uh, I just want to show you that everybody's human, right? Uh, you know, uh, Amanda had um, a wonderful blessing this past week. Uh, she got uh, called in by a project manager who wanted to meet with her and, and they got together and he uh, kind of commented to her about some of the work he's been seeing her do and different things, and that led to a, a wonderful conversation and perhaps a mentoring opportunity. A- and so uh, she had this wonderful uh, blessing. She came home. She shared it with me, and I'm like, you know, this is exciting. This is really cool. And one of the things that he wanted to ask her is he said, well, what, what's your career goals? You know, what, what, where do you want to end up? What do you want to do? You know, it, what's your goals with, with State Farm? And, and so I, uh, I don't remember if I said that out loud to her or not, or I played with it in my own mind afterwards. I said, I thought, you know, nobody's asked me what my career goals are. Nobody's asked me what. So here you go, a freebie, free of charge, you know. You, you, I'm just going to hand it out to you. Uh, my career goals are for Amanda to do well enough at State Farm that I can stay at home. Duh, right? <laughs> you know, the truth is, is I, I do love uh, what I do. I love all of you. I, I love uh, network, and I, I love seeing what God has done here. Uh, and so I kind of say that a little bit with tongue-in-cheek, although, I mean, who doesn't kind of envy the time when you can, uh, uh, you know, do what you want, when you want, how you want? But let's face it, that's not retirement, is it? I'll say, to you, you know, we may think that's what retirement is, but, it, but it's not always quite, quite so. But when you think about people, people do tend to be in pursuit of the next thing for something more. You know, life is, is driven for many people by what's around the next corner, whether that's an achievement, whether that's a new stage in, in the workplace, whether it's schooling, whether it's an experience. Uh, People are driven by the next thing around the next corner. I I suppose in one sense you can say we're addicts because, you know, we we find pleasure in something and then we want more. And and what we find is is what satisfied us today no longer satisfies us. Isn't that how addictions work, right? What satisfies us today no longer satisfies us. We need something more, whether it's a workplace, whether it's home, whether it's vacation, experience. We always seem to be driven by something more. For perhaps you've heard somebody say, I just need something to look forward to. And, and, and I know people who say, well, I don't like surprises because I need something to look forward to. I need something that I can go for. You know, when I was, uh, when I was young, you know, yesterday, Right. Well, when I was, I was young and a little kid, I, I could remember, I, I could remember thinking, I can't wait till I no longer have to take naps. <laughs> yeah, I laugh at that now too. Right. <laughs> but I, I can remember when I was a little kid, I, I can't wait till I no longer have to take naps. And I remember seeing my older brother out there mowing the yard, and I was like, I can't wait till I can get out there and mow the yard. And I can remember thinking when I was a little kid, I can't wait till I can start shaving. (laughs) Now I think, what was I thinking, (laughs) right? But we're always looking forward. We're looking to the next thing. You know, as kids, we want to grow up. As grown-ups, we want to be young again. When we get to college, we're looking forward to the first job. When we're in the first job, we're looking forward to retirement. 
or the next position in the job, right? Once we're retired, we look forward to the next place we can have coffee with a, a bunch of other old people complaining about all these problems we can't solve, right? <laughs> On Mondays, we're looking forward to Fridays. There's always something. We're looking forward to something that's around the corner. Is it any wonder that we struggle to be content and to just be satisfied in this present moment with who God is and who we are in relationship to him. You know, before God declares to Abram, he says, walk before me and be blameless. Before he reveals that to, uh, says that to Abram, he reveals a new name, the name that we're going to look at today, which is El Shaddai. And we're going to talk a little bit about that name. But, but just in, in brief, uh, when God says to Abram, I am El Shaddai, he's stating, I am all you need. I am all you need. Not whatever lies around the next corner, not the next milestone that you're working toward, not some experience that you're, that you're wanting to have. I am all you need. I am enough. And so we might ask ourselves the question, well, how can I walk before God and be blameless? Well, in one effect, uh, it's only when El Shaddai becomes my one supply. When it's God that I'm looking to for life and not the next experience, not the next blessing, not the next vacation, but it's God himself through whom I'm deriving my life from. And so as I introduce this next name of God, the question I want us to wrestle with is, is pretty simple, right? Is God enough? And I kind of say it's simple, but it's, it's kind of funny as well because, you know, we've been looking at all these names. We looked at Elohim, the mighty creator. We've looked at Yahweh, the personal covenant God, Adonai, the sovereign Lord. I won't pretend to go through all of them, right? Yahweh Rapha, Yahweh Rohi. Uh, so the Lord our healer, the Lord our shepherd. We looked at him as our peace. Uh, Yahweh Sada, the Lord of hosts, right? We've looked at all these things and said, oh boy, God is big enough. And, and mentally, Mentally, you know, somebody asks us that question, sure, God's enough. God is big and mighty and majestic. But the question is, is God enough for you? That you don't need everything else. Is God enough for those Monday blues? Is he enough for those childhood longings? Is God enough for those workplace struggles? Is God enough when the calendar is full? Or is God enough when there's nothing on the horizon except for the mundane daily routine that's in and out every day over and over and over again? Is God enough? Is God enough when the relationships aren't quite what we hoped they would be? Or when the 401k takes a dive? Is God enough when there's financial crisis or relational crisis? Is God enough? I remember one day I was, I know you guys get tired of hearing it, but I was out running, right? And I, and I remember just coming to a place of, of saying to myself in that time, I'm like, God, you're enough. Whether or not I get what I want, God, you're enough. Because, you know, our lives can be full of activity and still empty of meaning if they're apart from God. And when we think about all these names of God that we've been looking at, all the names of God have been revealed in the context of life. And, and the name El Shaddai is the same. It's a name that God reveals in the context of life. So in verse 1, he comes to Abram and he says, I am God Almighty. The translation is El Shaddai. And we're going to end our, our series. Uh, I'm going to fess up. I'm, I'm having second thoughts of whether I'm ending it with this name or not. So... So I might have lied to you. I don't know yet. All right? <laughs> so if I change something on you next week, uh, don't be... I'm just saying, I'm just throwing it out there. I, I, might, I might add one more to this series. I haven't decided yet. It just kind of occurred to me today. <laughs> so we might be ending the series, or we might not, with one of the oldest names revealed for God, which happens to be most prevalently found in the book of Job. Most commonly in the book of Job. And it's most often translated God Almighty. Uh, those scholars differ into the context of this name and, and what it means. And he comes to Abram, and in fact, he's saying, am I enough? Abram has his covenant. Abram has his promise. Abram's 99. Abram doesn't have the one thing that he's longed for the most. Am I enough? Am I enough? Uh, so as you think about the breakdown of this name, El, of course, means strong one. 
and opinions vary on the breakdown of Shaddai. That's where the question comes down. Some, some point to Shaddai as being a translation of God of the Mountains. Others, as uh, Elwell points out, break the name down to a composite. They look at Shah, the one who, and, and die, is sufficient. And they combine that with the verb Shaddad. See what I have to deal with every week, right? Uh, which means to overpower. And so they arrive at the idea of uh, the one who is all-powerful, totally self-sufficient, absolute ruler. And you know, all those things would be true of God. Other scholars, including Elwa, who goes on to talk about, the, they break down, it's not Shah, it's Shad, and, and, uh, which means breast. You never know what you're going to hear about in church, right? <laughs> Maybe a Song of Solomon next week. Uh, you know, uh, so they break it down, and, and uh, that's, see, I, I had lib and I get in trouble. Uh, <laughs> But shod, which means breast, and it's a metaphor for the God who nourishes, supplies, and satisfies. And, and Andrew Jukes, in the names of God, he explains it this way. He says, the thought expressed in the name Shaddai describes power, but it is the power not of violence, but of all bountifulness. Shaddai primarily means breasted, being formed directly from the Hebrew word shad, that is breast. And Parkhurst explains the name Shaddai as one of the divine titles meaning the poorer or shedder forth, that is, of blessings, temporal and spiritual. If this is seen, he's, he goes on to say, I need hardly explain how this title, the breasted or the poor forth, came to mean almighty. And he goes on to talk about uh, how mothers would understand it and how a babe is pining, a babe is starving, its life is going out, it cannot take man's proper food, this baby will die until he's given life until he's nourished by his mother. And this is how the mom has almost infinite power over the child. And he goes on to talk about how this is El Shaddai, the poorer forth, who pours himself out for his creatures, who gives to them his lifeblood, who sheds forth his spirit and says, come unto me and drink, and who thus by the sacrifice of himself gives himself in his very nature to those who will receive him, that his perfect will may be accomplished in them. And actually, he goes on for another page, but that's as much as... But isn't that an interesting thought? El Shaddai, the God who nourishes us, the God in whom we find life itself, who has all that we need essential for life. Wiersbe wraps up the discussion with this. He's kind of taking all these ideas and bringing them the, together. He says, if we combine these several ideas, we might say that El Shaddai is the name of the all-powerful and all-sufficient God who can do anything and meet any need. We need nothing more and nothing less will do. God is enough. You know, I, I find it interesting that this name is most prevalent in Job. In fact, it occurs like 30 times in the book of Job. And, and, and I find that interesting because, you know, it's one thing for us to say God is enough when life is good, when the health is good, when the job is good, when the home is good and relationships are flourishing. It's one thing to say God is enough in that context. But we all know that wasn't the context of Job. Suffering and death and loss. And yet this name is the most prevalent in the book of Job. The one who says God is sufficient. God is all that we need. So as we look at our text today, you know, uh, just to, to bring you up to chapter 17, God, God has made a covenant with Abram. Uh, and you might remember that when God made this covenant with Abram, he was not a spring chicken, right? He was 75 years old. And at 75, God comes to Abram in Genesis chapter 12, and he says to Abram, he says, I'm going to make of you a great nation, a nation through whom all the other peoples of the world will be blessed. Now, there's only one problem to this, and that is Abram doesn't have any children. He's already 75 years old. God comes, says, I'm going to make of you a great nation. By the time we hit Genesis chapter 15, Abram's kind of figured out that already that um, yeah, I don't see this promise happening. I don't see this coming to fulfillment. How can I help God out? Well, I'll tell you what, God, uh, Eliezer of Damascus can be my heir, a servant of my house. You can use a servant of my house to build this nation from. God says, nope, that's not how it's going to be. 
So we come to Genesis chapter 16. In Genesis 16, 11 years have passed. Now, we're a people, we don't like to wait on microwave popcorn. <laughs> 11 years since God came and gave this promise to Abram. Not days, not months, 11 years. And uh, it's kind of corny. I was thinking, you know, at this point, Abram has no hair, right? Because he's getting old or, and no heir. At 86, sorry. I sh Sometimes you just have to, right? And so Abram and Sarai decide, you know what? Let's help God out. Now, if you know the story, Sarai gives Abram, her maidservant, in which to have a child who was Ishmael. Because we're going to help God out. Because I don't see how nations are going to come for me when I'm now 86 and I still have no child. And what does God say? No, it's not going to be Ishmael. Not going to be Ishmael. Another 13 years have passed before we hit our text today. Now, for those who are mathematically challenged, that means 24 years since the original covenant. 24 years since God made the promise to Abram to make him a great nation. And he still doesn't have the child through whom God is going to make a great nation. And let me tell you, what seemed improbable at 75 must seem impossible at 99. In fact, it's interesting. God comes and he reveals himself with this new name to Abram. And we have this wonderful conversation taking place. And, and, and I'll give you uh, Abram's response. We didn't read it as far in our text. But in Abram's response, after he's changed to Abraham in verse 17, Abraham, Abraham fell face down. He laughed and said to himself, Will a son be born to a man a hundred years old? Will Sarah bear a child at the age of 90? And Abraham said to God, If only Ishmael might live under your blessing. God, I'm old. I don't even know if I care anymore, right? Just use Ishmael. Just use Ishmael. I know that wasn't your plan. That's what you said. But God, it's been 24 years. I'm old. She's old. Well, he probably didn't say that because I'd get a guy in trouble, right? Ishmael was Abr Abram's shortcut. And at 99, he, he certainly has shown himself a man of faith, but he's about to have a new revelation of who God is, as El Shaddai. And you know, I think about that knowledge of God is a lifelong pursuit. It's a lifelong pursuit. And I hope it's a pursuit that you carry well beyond any sermon series that we do here uh, because you're never too old to see God revealed in new ways. If Abram's 99 and he's revealing and he's learning something new about God, then I, I think he just took away any of our excuses, right? And, and we might ask ourselves, why? Why would God give him the promise 24 years, really 25 years before the child be born, before the promise would be fulfilled. Why, why not sooner? Why not just wait? If God knew he wasn't going to give Abram this child until this point, why, why not just wait till he's 99 to give him the news? Well, he might have had a heart attack at 99. It was the first time, right? But why not wait till 99? So I, I need you to understand that this is speculation. This isn't in the scriptures. This is just a thought that I'm throwing out there. Perhaps you know, when, when God came to Abram and said, I'm going to give you a child at 75 what do you think Abram wanted more than anything else in the world? That child. And perhaps part of this 24 years was for Abram to learn that even, in, even with the blessing, right, he needed to want God more than the blessing. He needed to be a place where God's enough. God's enough. You know, I was reading uh, some of the Psalms this morning, and, you know, one of the things it said is, Blessed is the man whose transgression is forgiven. 
And you know what occurred to me as I read that? So, so often we're looking at all these things and, well, I'm blessed because this and this and this and this and this, or I'm not feeling so blessed because of this, 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 and this. Well, you know what? The Psalms pretty much says, if you're forgiven, if you're in Jesus Christ, that's blessing enough, right? Because that means we've got a ticket to heaven. That's blessing enough, just that God not be uh, holding our, our sins against us that we're forgiven. You know, I, I think that there's something about Abram, this promise was planted in the life of Abram, but yet he needed to know that God's still more important. And God is still sufficient, and God's going to do what God's going to do. So Abram needed to know that he was not only almighty, but God was sufficient, and that God was enough. And that God will supply abundantly. So in verse 2, God says, I will confirm, I will do what you've been unable to do on your own. And as we look at the name El Shaddai, we see one who has the power to fulfill every promise, no matter how unlikely it may seem. And so in verse 2, he comes to Abram, he says, uh, I will greatly increase your numbers. And verses 4 uh, and 5, he says, I'm going to make you the father of many nations. In verse 6, he says, you're going to be fruitful. And not only are nations going to come from you, but kings are going to come from you. And in verses 7 through 8, he pulls in the promise of the land. Now, I want you to think for a moment. So God says, I'm going to change your name from Abram to Abraham, right? Because Abraham means the father of <laughs> many nations, right? Can't you just see people in the household? Oh, uh, don't call me Abram anymore. My name is Abraham now. <laughs> Because I'm going to have to, I'm going to be the father of many nations. And they're like, I think he's lost it, <laughs> right? Can't you just think about what the people in this household are thinking? Talk about faith. Believing what you do not yet see. God changes his name. Now history records for us that God was faithful to keep his promise. We have that benefit, don't we? God is faithful to perform every word that he has spoken. Nothing is too hard for the Lord. And, and, you know, sometimes we need to keep that in mind when we think about his promises to us and we begin to doubt uh, whether God is going to fulfill what he's spoken. We can look back at people like Abram and say, you know, God is faithful. And we can look in the New Testament and see that all his promises to us are what in Jesus Christ? I think the word is yes. That's in 1 Corinthians. Somebody can check it out later, right? It just came to mind. All his promises to us are yes in Jesus Christ. It's in one of the Corinthians. Maybe Amanda will throw it in at the end because we tend to do that, right? One scholar put it this way. Elohim creates nature. El Shaddai compels nature to do his bidding. Even when it's contrary to nature. News flash: most 90-year-old women aren't having babies. Right? Yeah, thank goodness. El Shaddai. And Abram holds on to the promise even when he only sees it in part, what others are going to see in full. Uh, Hebrews 11 is a, it gives a wonderful little, uh, several verses on the faith of Abram and several others if you want to look at, at, at that. The problem is, is we don't like to wait on God. And sometimes, uh, sometimes as we await the fulfillment, we have better ideas of how God should do it or how we think it, it's going to happen. And so we, we try to help God out instead of just saying, you know, God, you're enough. Your time is enough. Your presence is enough. And I'm just going to trust you until I see you work out what you have promised. You know, in El Shaddai, we find the one who, uh, we find life. In verses 5 and 6, uh, God says, no longer will you be called Abram. Your name will be Abraham, for I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you very fruitful. I will make nations of you, and kings will come from you. And the name change is kind of a, a tantamount to, to God rewriting Abram's destiny. God rewriting his destiny. So at 99, he experiences a, a significant turning point in life. I guess that means there's hope for all of us, right? God's not done with him. He's 99 years old. God's not done. There's hope for, for all of us. And, and the name change is reflective of God bringing life where there is no life. God bringing fruit where there is no fruit. He's rewriting his destiny. 
saying, I still have a purpose. You know, many today are, are living defeated lives, and, and it's not because they're bad. Usually their hearts are in a good place, but they're often looking to find life in something rather than someone. And so we're looking to the pay raise. We're looking to the next house. We're looking to the next uh, technological gizmo. We're looking to the next relationship. We're looking for life in something rather than someone, someone being a capital S. The corollary to that is, is we try to live out of our own strength and create our own destiny rather than relying on El Shaddai, the one through whom we find life and who is all-sufficient. And so God comes and he says, I'm going to give new life to Abraham and Sarah. Uh, he speaks also of their descendants who are going to come through Abraham and Sarah uh, and how the peoples of the earth will be blessed. Of course, we know uh, as we look at Galatians that the seed of Abraham that we're eventually going to get to is Jesus Christ through whom the nations are going to be blessed and the world's going to be blessed. Uh, uh, and the one who truly gives us life and one of the things we need to understand is that God's blessing isn't intended just to rest on us, but to pass through us. And so we realize that when we're no longer consumed with finding life for ourselves, but that we find ourselves in the pursuit of knowing God, of walking with him, of inviting him to work in and through us, then we realize that in him is the life we've been looking for all along. That he is indeed enough that we can find joy in him, that we can find peace in him, that we can have life in him despite the circumstances that are surrounding us. So Abram has waited 24 years. And by waiting, we should use that a little loosely because you know he tried to help God out a couple of times along the way, right? And in that midst of that time, he found that he in himself was insufficient. He could not do he could not fulfill the promise that God had for him on his own strength. And, and, you know, I think for many of us, that's kind of a picture of our trying to live the Christian life. And then, kind of a picture of us trying to live the Christian life. I'm going to do better next time. I'm going to change this. I'm going to be a better husband. I'm going to be a better, you know, for, for some of you, wife, right? Because that one doesn't apply to me, right? I'm going to be a better parent. I'm going to change the way that I think. There's a lot of I in how we address the Christian life for many of us. A lot of I, this is what I'm going to do. In fact, we heard some about that in testimonies this morning, didn't we? In the Faith to Life group. Perhaps we need to discover El Shaddai, the almighty, all-sufficient one, that it's not so much about what I do, it's about what I allow him to do in me and through me. El Shaddai comes to Abram and he says, walk before me, which is another way of saying live with the awareness that I'm always present, I'm always watching, right? Uh, live in a way that, that I would find pleasing. And he says, be blameless. And, and we need to understand Abram uh, was not a perfect person by any means. And, and the idea of blameless here is probably that idea of a single devotion for God. Walk before me and be blameless. Be, be devoted to me singly, not, not any other gods. But before God comes and he says, walk before me and be blameless, he says, I am El Shaddai. Because, you know, no matter how hard I may try, I can't live the Christian life on my own. You know, I can, I can grunt, I can sweat, I can perspire, I can work hard, I can do everything I want to do. And the thing that's not going to happen is I cannot produce the fruit that God seeks on my own. I can't do it. But you know what I can do? I can bear the fruit that God produces in me. There's a difference, isn't there? There's a difference between producing the fruit and bearing the fruit, isn't there? I can't produce it, but I can bear the fruit that God can produce in me and through me out of a relationship with him. So how can I walk before God and be blameless? Well, only when El Shaddai is my one supply. And, and we understand that, that all these names of God, we see them fulfilled eventually in Jesus Christ, right? So, so God has supplied for the forgiveness of my sins through Jesus Christ, and he supplies and nourishes us for life through his Holy Spirit, right? So all these things come into play as we think about these names of God. But it's only in him that I can find life. 
And as long as I'm looking to the world to give me what only God can give me, I'm always going to be frustrated. And I'm always going to be defeated until I learn that God is indeed enough and that I drive my life in him and through him. Amen. And your bullet